Hello and welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative director is Nancy Cole. And this is a program that examines arts and culture around Tampa Bay from various perspectives. And the perspective we have today is very exhilarating. Today, our guest is Todd Smith, executive director of the Tampa Museum of Art, who came here in 2008 with his first responsibility being to guide the completion and the opening of the 66,000 square foot new museum. And he did very well. The museum got an international award, uh, architectural award, which it uh, shared with um, the new Acropolis Museum, which is, puts it in very good company. And at this moment, we have a very, very strong collection called the Phillips Collection. It's 100 works of art and works of American art that come from the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC. I'll let him speak about uh, the collection and what it means not only to uh, Washingtonians and visitors, but to American art as well. Welcome. Thanks, Sandy. Good to be here. I'm glad you're here. And I think uh, everybody is thrilled to know that there's such a substantial a number of works under uh, consideration for everybody in Tampa. Oh. And, and as a matter of fact, before I go any further, every so often, is it the Bank of America which creates a Sunday in which... Uh, um, uh, for Bank of America cardholders. For Bank of America cardholders only. Uh, the oh, first okay. weekend. <laughs> But, well, for all of the others, I'm sure there's an opportunity to come to, to right. um, the, uh, the museum. Um, what, uh, this, this exhibit traveled to Spain, to Japan, to several uh, cities in America, and we are uh, holding it now. We are the last uh, venue, right? We are the last venue. And uh, tell us about the Phillips collection and sure. Mr. Phillips himself. Uh, the Phillips Collection opened in 1921 yeah. as a memorial gallery that Duncan Phillips started. His brother and his father had just passed away the year prior, and he wanted to do something to remember his, his uh, father and brother. Mm -hmm. And so in his house, which is right off of DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., he opened three of the rooms as a gallery to the public. Mm -hmm. um, keep in mind, this is 1921. Um, Washington, D.C. was... Hmm. Not as cosmopolitan as it is now. Right. <laughs> Some would argue mm -hmm. um, it, it never was cosmopolitan. But for mm -hmm. Duncan Phillips, it was a chance to show modern art in the nation's capital. And it was mm -hmm. the first museum that ever opened in the United States devoted to modern art, mm -hmm. um, predating the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Whitney Museum, the Guggenheim, all of those in New York City. And what it was able to do was allow Phillips the chance to collect art that he was passionate about. And the title of the exhibition is To See as Artists See. And Duncan collected art so he could understand how artists saw the world. Mm -hmm. And as you walk through the exhibition, uh, the 100 works, which span 1850 to 1960, so it's a great breadth of, of uh, American history, a century, yeah. uh, you get a sense, at least I get a sense, that a lot of the work still has a memorial quality to it. Mm. There's a strong sense of personality that you see in the works that another museum might not have collected along these lines. Um, so he's often compared to um, the Barnes collection mm -hmm. in, outside of Philadelphia, now in Philadelphia. And the difference between how Dr. Barnes collected and how Phillips collected is, is really quite telling. Phillips wanted his works to be in constant dialogue with each other. So in his museum, he would change the works around quite frequently. So you would never go in and see the same works positioned next to each other. Barnes felt very strongly that every work yeah. had to stay exactly where he had placed it. I think it's in his will. Yeah, very, very fact, so. right. I think it's the only thing in his will, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what Duncan did was create this idea that art can be changeable, mm -hmm. that it's not just something that hangs on a wall, but it does have meaning and purpose far and vast beyond what we see just hanging in a museum. That's a, it's a very interesting concept. Well, yeah. um, he was in a position, I take it, to collect he had the wherewithal. Wherewithal. His parents, mm -hmm. uh, when his father died and when his brother died, he was the only male living heir. And so he, in he inher inherited quite a bit of money and was able to parlay that mm -hmm. into real uh, collecting. Mm -hmm. And he, But he was collecting artists who were still working. Mm 
or mm -hmm. starting their careers even. So he was able to get a lot of work at reasonable prices, but we would think of reasonable prices. You know, Edward Hopper, he was able to buy for less than $1,000, um, something we would all love to be able to do these you days. <laughs> um, but at the same time, he was buying Hopper for a relatively inexpensive amount. He was spending $10,000 on other works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this collection, you see also the shifting history of American collecting that some artists, of course, are valuable at the time you collect them. They become more valuable and or less valuable as time goes on. That's right. And you know that the history of museums is also the history of changing tastes, what people want to see at certain times. And this is almost, too, a, uh, a kind of a march of, his, of American art mm -hmm. history. Uh, and at the time he started collecting, which I take it was prior to 21. He right. was amassing that, and he continued to yes. buy. Uh, was there? Was there such a thing as the American art that everyone recognized, uh -huh. uh, or how how did it how did it stand in the pecking order of okay. art? Um, you know, for America didn't really come into its own on the international art scene mm -hmm. until after World War II. Prior to that, most of what developed in the United States was either a specific reaction to something going on in America at that time, or it was a reaction to European art that these American artists saw as they went abroad to study or, or just to visit. Mm -hmm. So beginning in about 1825, you have the emergence of the Hudson River School painting, which mm -hmm. is the first truly indigenous American style of painting for, mm -hmm. for settlers. And it was the celebration of the landscape, primarily the landscape north of New York City. Um, artists would go with their sketchbooks out into nature and would sketch in the nature and then come back into their studios in New York and create these finished paintings. And so the landscape becomes the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And you see this throughout American painting well into the middle of the 20th century, that landscape is still something that matters and matters deeply. So there's this connection America has with the land that's important to keep in mind. Um, by the latter part of the 19th century, American artists are going to Paris, they're studying in Europe, they're coming to terms with Impressionism, some are rejecting it outright, others mm -hmm. are adapting and adopting parts of the, of the style they're seeing, but American Impressionism never fully lets go the way that French Impressionism does. So in this exhibition, for instance, there are I think about 10 paintings that are, you can call truly impression, American Impressionist paintings, and you always have a sense in these paintings that there's a structure underneath. These are not the um, haystacks or the Rouen cathedrals of Monet. These are substantive buildings that have light dappled in front of them. Um, hmm. And that's, I think, is a little bit of a pragmatic, it shows the pragmatic quality of, of the American life of the 19th century. We weren't a bohemian culture like Paris was. Yeah. We were still strongly holding on to certain puritanical views. Right. <laughs> and right, dedicated to making money. It is. Uh, um, the Ashcan School yes. was uh, in the 20th century. The right. Ashcan School starts, uh, their Mark first showing, new. 1908 was the mm -hmm. first time these eight artists who um, they showed together. And they weren't really, we say a school, but they didn't study together. They, they didn't have the same philosophy on life, but they represented something new and different from what had gone before. Many of these artists, these eight artists, had started life as newspaper illustrators. So mm -hmm. their original intent of making art was to capture the scene quickly for an audience to read it in a quick fashion like you would in a newspaper. This was well before photography was used for daily newspapers. Yeah. You'd have sketch artists go out and sketch the fire or sketch the what, whatever was the, was the hot news story of the day. Um, when they transitioned to be from newspaper illustrators to painters, they kept that style, that sketchy, fast quality style. And when they showed together, the critic referred to their style of painting as similar to an ash can, which was a euphemism for a trash can. Right. So he wasn't claiming their work belonged in the trash can, but the, but the style and the color palette primarily was something that you would see in a, in a, in a garbage heap. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of browns and beiges, right. not a lot of high key colors. And, and the subject matter was a little bit plebeian, wasn't it? It was, it was middle class or lower middle class life. It yeah. was not celebrating the aristocracy or the political figures of the day. It mm -hmm. was about people that they saw on the streets around them in New York City primarily. And so you have this beginning in the early part of the 20th century right. um, coming to terms with American life in an urban environment. Right, at that, at that point, let's say in New York City, was the Metropolitan Museum of Art 
a, a, in fact, built as an institution at that time? I want to say yes, that it, that it, had, yeah. that it had opened. Uh -huh. And a lot of the reasons that large cities in the later part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century opened civic museums was to elevate sure. middle class right. views about the world. It was, they were meant to be truly educational and, and uplifting institutions. Uh -huh. And so you had this great movement among museum um, leaders that these institutions were there to better society. Mm -hmm. um, and so people were encouraged to go on Saturdays and Sundays, and and we have that same feeling even a hundred years later. Sure. Uh, the directors today, though, I think would be much more interested in gathering a, a, a great range of expression, yeah. artistic expression, than, than directors then who, who wanted something uplifting. Uplifting might be from their viewpoint. What, were the Ashcan artists included at that point? Or Not when they, they first came on the scene. I mean, uh -huh. they were collected later on, and each of the major museums around the country have had right. um, their own unique take on collecting art of their time. Right. You know, some will wait a while to see what actually separates out as good or bad, uh, you know, with a 20 or 30 year perspective. Others will dive right in mm -hmm. um, and take risks. And so that's a great story of American museums is yeah. you've got these museums that early on were early adopters with great new contemporary work and there were others who waited a while. Were there any uh, executive directors whose vision you think was particularly important? Um, yeah, one of the, one of the most intriguing early directors was Chick Austin, who worked at the Wadsworth, who's director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, mm -hmm. and then was also the director of the Ringling Museum. Oh, really? Um, in the 1940s. How interesting! I think that's right, but, but really right after the Ringling opened, um, mm -hmm. and he was radical and what he brought in terms of exhibition design, mm -hmm. how he tried to reinvigorate the museum environment, um, and then directors of the Brooklyn Museum and the Newark Museum both felt a strong sense of building for their communities, building mm -hmm. for their neighborhoods. They weren't there to be world leaders in a certain field. They were there to serve the needs of their local community. You have you selected at least um, four of uh, the works, and uh, I'm assuming that they do reflect uh, a kind of a progress in American art. And, uh, and, and an insight into Duncan Phillips's collecting interests. Yeah, right. So we start with Child Hassam's Washington Square Arch a scene that Hassam lived. He lived actually right across the street from the arch. And the arch had just been built. Mm -hmm. And so what you see in this painting is not only a document of New York life, but also a sense of how life had changed. You know, you have in the latter part of the 19th century, major urban cities building these grand boulevards as a way for, to help with issues of um, hygiene, because the larger the streets, you know, the easier to clean them. Certainly. But also, these were grand boulevards on which you would parade sure. on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. You know, Paris, of course, being the best example of that. But New York mm -hmm. was similar in terms of how it sort of looked at its public space. And so Hassam is capturing the sense of how different groups interacted in this new public space. So mm -hmm. you've got a, a mother and child, you've got a street sweeper. Um, you know, both of them are part of the same public space, but yet they belong in two different worlds. Um, and if you look at the style of the painting, it's of course American Impressionist style, but again, back to the point about American artists never really let go completely. You still see the arch in its full sense of, of monumentality and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, but then if you look forward into some of the other paintings, as Phillips in his own collecting, we will see, became more interested in abstract art and abstraction in and of itself. Um, so the next painting is by Arthur Dove, entitled Red Sun. Uh -huh. And Dove was taking this interest in American landscape painting and reducing it down to very simple forms, very easily identified, that had an emotional content, a sense that it was gonna strike you. Phillips collected Dove in depth. I think there are 40 some paintings in the Phillips collection by Arthur Dove. And Dove and Georgia O'Keeffe are often linked because their styles are so similar, taking nature and abstracting it. His is a little bit more abstract than hers, I'd yeah. say. Um, tell me about him. What is his background? Um, Eastern? He's, um, New York based mm -hmm. and started life uh, again, as a landscape painter, and just over time was exposed to European new styles of art. Mm -hmm. um, like O'Keeffe, he was in and around Alfred Stieglitz, um, the great 
photographer who also revolutionized American uh, gallery yeah. galleries because with his 291 gallery and subsequent galleries, he started to show art not in the old style, which would have been floor to ceiling, large paintings hung in the middle, yeah. small paintings up to the ceiling, small paintings to the ground. Right. But he would take a painting out of that context and show it on a white wall by itself. Huh. So how we now look at art in museums and gallery contexts, Stieglitz revolutionized that for us. Right. And very similar to how O'Keeffe took landscape and nature and did a close-up, Stieglitz was doing the same thing. He's asking you to get close to a painting so you could understand it. Did Phillips uh, mount his exhibitions uh, in the same way with enough space around so that it uh, right. the observer could concentrate on it. Yeah, and, and as the years went on, Philip started with just with three rooms in his house, mm -hmm. then the collection started taking over. The more of the house, more of the house, more of the house, and finally he and his family moved out of the house. Out of the house. He had, they had to. <laughs> it became a museum. And <laughs> since then, they've added on uh, numerous times. Right. Um, when did the practice of, of providing notes to the public as they came in uh, make its, its a, entrance? If you look at American paintings, mm -hmm. um, some of the large 19th century landscapes by Frederick Church and um, Bierstadt, <laughs> but they would have brochures. Ah that would be handed out by and the used artist? by the artist ah. and oftentimes there'd be a poem the artist had written or some sort of <laughs> description that they wanted you to get out of it mm -hmm. I and mean, there's these great stories of um I don't forget if it was Church or Bierstadt, one of those two landscape painters of the 19th century, would stand behind, these paintings would go on view as a single painting exhibition. Oh, really? And you pay 25 cents to go and see it. And it was surrounded by all this bunting, and above each painting would be a portrait of Washington and, and Jefferson. So you got a sense that this was all part of the national discourse. Mm -hmm. And the artist would stand behind the bunting and listen to people's comments. Oh, that's not a, that's always <laughs> that's not a always good bad. idea. That's always bad. But he, they'd also hand out pamphlets about how to interpret the paintings. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. In case you missed Washington <laughs> above the painting, letting you know that this was manifest destiny and this was the way God intended <laughs> westward expansion to happen. There was Washington and Jefferson there to tell you this is how it goes. The price for art, of course, was not what it is today, even accounting for yeah. inflation and everything else. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of the artists uh, eked out an mm -hmm. existence. Um, uh, how did Phillips find them? That's a great question. I don't know if I can really answer that. I know that he, throughout his life, kept strong connections with artists who, of course, would introduce him to other artists. Yeah. Um, even up to the last few years of, life, of his life, he was still collecting. He was still trying to make sense of contemporary art. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at the collection, it shows artists that he had a strong interest in, and then artists that he was trying to make sense of as his life went on. Um, so some of the later artists, like Jackson Pollock and others mm. of the Abstract Expressionist movement, he was still coming to terms with, right. figuring out how they're going to fit into his vision of yeah. what his collection should be. In, during the World War II, uh, their, their uh, abstraction sort of yeah. <laughs> followed, but there were people like uh, Richard uh, Florsheim, mm -hmm. Who, uh, whose work, to me, I think I've seen them in, in, in the kind of thing was reproduced in, in motels and mm -hmm. hotels. It was burnt, scorched earth, sort of, yeah. a very grim view of uh, the landscape. And he, he, did, he was in the war, uh, I, don't, I don't think actively, but okay. enough to know what, uh, what it was doing to um, Europe. Yeah. Uh, and, and, he, and I'm sure there were other artists with, like him uh, who, and then, it just kind of disappeared, or it was taken over by others who had a different uh, abstract view mm -hmm. of things. Um, and there's a sense, too, if you look at American paintings and someone like Jackson Pollock, mm -hmm. that he's coming out of an American tradition of painting. And we can trace it back, even in, in this exhibition, to artists such as Marsden Hartley um, and Albert Pinkham Ryder, two key players in the Phillips collection, uh -huh. of the sense of the romantic landscape. And if you look at the early Pollock, become, before he becomes the all-over drip canvas that, that we know of as the mature Pollock, his work was very much influenced by, these, by this idea of the American landscape, but also by the American psyche. He was mm -hmm. undergoing Jungian psychoanalysis hmm. throughout the 30s and 40s, and you see these mythic figures appearing in, in, in his works that are vaguely landscape-esque. And so you've got, as we see throughout American art, and that's what the great thing about the Phillips Collection is, this connection between the natural and the human, and the ways in which the human experience is defined by nature, and then also how it takes Affected. complete, 
opposite view of nature. You look at a painting like the Edward Hopper that I, that's um, in the collection, Sunday. You know, it shows this lone figure it, in yeah. Hoboken, New Jersey, sitting in front of a, an, a, you know, a, an empty storefront. Mm -hmm. But and all of his works have of, this isolation. Yeah. And sometimes even a kind of a foreboding, the, the, some of the buildings sort of loom over. Right. The right. creatures yeah, again, under this, them. This is the idea of how the human makes sense of this new urban environment. Right, uh, or who is who is very much crushed by it or diminished right. by it. Right. I, I mean, at the same time, uh, this adulation of, of the landscape um, is a time when national parks are being uh, under Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Well, people who are wanting to, to make money out of the yeah. <laughs> landscape are at work. So that whole dynamic of, uh, isn't this wonderful, What? how can I make a buck out of right. it, is uh, going on all the time. It's and always been a push-pull. There's always been that push-pull. And then if you, you introduce photography into the mix, yeah. the, eight, the latter part of the 19th century, and you have landscape painters now that have to look at landscape differently. Yeah. Their job is not to replicate nature in its complete and full utter detail because sure. the photograph can do it and do it better. Right. So what does the landscape painter have to do? They move toward impressionism, they move toward a more romantic feeling about it, and they move toward abstraction. Mm -hmm. So this collection again tells those three great stories of what comes after photography. And then you jump ahead a little bit and you can look at Hopper in terms of filmmaking. Mm. You know, oftentimes his work is referred to uh, like it looks like a movie still. It does. A single still of something, there's a narrative that exists before and a narrative after, we're not sure what it is, but you know that this is a moment that matters mm -hmm. in the Hopper painting. He captures that, there's a silence to the work um, from the paintings. And another um, series that we have in, the, in this exhibition is by Jacob Lawrence, it's the Migration yeah. series. And these were 60 p paintings that Lawrence did in 1940, 1941 that sh tell of the migration of African Americans to the, from the American South to the urban North and right after World War I. Mm -hmm. And F Lawrence grew up in New Jersey and then um, his adolescence was spent in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And so heard stories from his family about what the migration would have been like and also researched it. So you've got these 12 by 18 panels and there are 60 of them in the full range for the full migration series and we're showing five of them. And these were done when Lawrence was 24 years old. So wow. right at the beginning of his career, and he tells this grand story of this 20th century American experience that does not happen anywhere else in the world. Right. And you, you look at these panels and you get a sense of, of the, 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 the joy, mm -hmm. but also the fear of what that's, might happen as right. you get to the North. That's very interesting because the, um, the warmth of different sons by I think Isabel Wilkerson mm -hmm. uh, traces that migration It was the greatest migration in America a and this was published about three years ago maybe right. uh, would be wonderful I know you had the history of ballet uh, the, when we did the Degas exhibition yes, yes. And in the Degas it would be wonderful if uh, she would come and talk about the migration and then there's the new book so the, the 12 tribes of Hattie as well which yes. is the Oprah that's right. Choice of the it's, month, I think. It's a fiction. It's, yeah. it's a little grimmer, I think, except that she takes, uh, Wilkerson takes three people, one from New Orleans who goes to uh, the West Coast, California, okay. one goes to Milwaukee to begin with, and right. then goes to Chicago, and one goes to New York and winds up doing rent parties. Okay. And, and, and immediately you get another slice of yeah. American life. It would be a lot of fun to And these that. 26 of these panels were... Um, reproduced in Fortune magazine oh, in the fall really? of 1941. Oh, how great. So there's this great, you yeah. know, uh, trying right. to understand, like mass culture was trying to make sense of the art world sure. in the 1930s and 40s. Right, right. And then the war came, and right. then suddenly America became important in America the art America because <laughs> London and Paris were, were suffering, and, yeah, and right. you know, a lot of artists had come to the U.S. in the 30s, mm -hmm. architects, designers, uh, engineers, uh -huh. had, had been escaping the rise of Nazi. Mm -hmm. um, in Europe and had come to New York, settled in New York, and at the same time, there's an opening up of the art world, um, and you have artists like again like Pollock and Rothko and Rosenquist and, and Rauschenberg and Johns and the whole group of right. artists who changed world art as we okay. know it, um, beginning about 1945, 1946, mm -hmm. well into the early 1960s. Right. Um, and right. by that and point, and then you had multiples that suddenly popped up. Right. Right. And, and again, it's, it's a new field. Yeah. And it's really uh, uh, obtainable. 
yes. by a lot of people who would love to have something of that. Right. That's very interesting. Well, are, are there going to be any um, lectures or anything in, con in conjunction with uh, this show? We're doing three lectures beginning on Wednesday, March 13th, the 20th, and the 27th ah, on right. Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh -huh. um, and the um, two of my colleagues from two of the other museums in Tampa, St. Pete, are going to okay. join me. And um, Jennifer Hardin, curator at the Museum of Fine Arts, St. Petersburg will do the first lecture, I'll yeah. do the second one, and then um, Jane Simon from um, CAM up at USF will do the third, and we're each going to look at a series of artists that are in the collection to give a fuller understanding of the artists in the show. It's terrific. I yeah. am so glad that there is this, this uh, collegial uh, movement that's right. going, because uh, we're, we're really a, a large community with this with this gulf in yeah. <laughs> between us. And I don't think it should separate us. I think it should be just the occasion for joining again. And there are so many opportunities for all of us to collaborate. And we're, right. as we're looking down the road, there are, there are things that we're not ready to announce yet, but there are major projects that will, that will impact and affect yeah. all of us in very good and positive so, ways. So we'll keep, we will keep um, uh, information through the uh, website. Yes. All right, that's very good. Well, what is, I do know that there is one coming after April because it has already been, uh, it's on the website. Right. We're doing um, the summer series of exhibitions will be devoted to Latin American oh. um, art, artists who are either Latin American by birth or artists who chose to portray images of Latin American life. Very so good. there'll be three exhibitions on you this summer. Any of them from Cuba? Um, one will be of a photographer showing scenes of Cuba. Good. Very good. Well, thank you very much. You've given us a really complete idea. Thank you. And it's something for everyone, really. It's American art, and it's important. Thanks for being with us and plan to join us again. Lead paint poisoning affects over 1 million children today. Dust from lead-based paint could cause violent behavior. If your home was built before 1978, log on to leadfreekids.org.